Welcome, cycling fans. I hope you've been enjoying all the amazing guests that I've been bringing you on the podcast to date. And before we get started, I want to share with you an amazing way that you can coach with me this winter. So if you've been liking all my coaching segments, you're going to love this program. So it's my 16 week online winter road cycling training program. Say that 10 times fast. So I've been doing this program for over 15 years. It's been usually local, but now it's online, which is even more amazing because I can impact more cyclists this way than in studio. The way it works is you're going to learn valuable cycling skills, such as have you ever asked yourself, first of all, how can I become a smoother, create a more smooth pedal stroke? Like, what are the four quadrants all these people have been talking about? And how can I get stronger on the hills? So here's the thing. It really comes down to the fundamentals and the basics skills of cycling, which when you get on your bike, you have nothing, you know nothing about. Now this is that, and that's what I'm going to drill into you over 16 weeks. So when you finish, you are going to know how to create a smooth pedal stroke and be more efficient. You're going to be climbing hills with much better technique. You're going to be building your sprint base and your endurance base is going to be much stronger. Now I have a special code for you. It's podcast in all uppercase to get $50 off either the VIP or the basic program. Now go to this website to check out what the differences are. Uh, Basically, the VIP is a much greater coaching program. So if you want more personalized coaching, goal setting, and we have a reported five to 20% increase in fitness. Can you imagine starting your spring with that kind of increase based on last year? So it's 16wkroadcycling.ca. So that's 16wkroadcycling.ca and use the code podcast to get $50 off. And if you have questions, just email me. I love to answer them. And I hope and look forward to coaching you to become better on the bike. I hope you enjoy the next episode. Have an amazing day. All right, everyone, welcome back for another amazing episode of Secrets from the Saddle, all things cycling podcast. And today we have a a really amazing person. Uh, He was uh, a referral to me from a friend, Jeff Cox, who I know from uh, uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. I've uh, invested in his company. So I was just like, and I talked to him and I said, uh, you know, do you know anybody who is into cycling? He's like, yeah my friend Corey Mortensen (laughs) and he wrote a book and you should meet him and I was like all right sounds like a perfect person to be on the on the podcast so this is Corey's book the Buddha and the bee and I'm telling you I don't know um so this is this took place 20 years ago and he's written it and published it just recently we're going to talk about this we're going to bring Corey out this is so fun his book is really really good and you know since then he's been an entrepreneur um he's written for various charities and we're really going to jump into you know how it all started because I'm really excited to bring this guest to the podcast welcome Corey Good morning. Thank you for having me. Oh, welcome. And I know like you're three hours behind, you're 6 30 in the morning. That's <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah. I had to get to bed at 5 30 last night to get up this early. Oh my gosh, stop it. <laughs> no. Um, so I always love uh asking everybody how they got into cycling because this is a cycling podcast, but I've had various people like, how did you get into cycling? Well, really, how how we got into it was um, non professionally was uh, when you know growing up in Scottsdale as a kid, our school was only about a mile and a half away, and or maybe even a half mile away. And then uh, if we wanted to play little league or any sports, we always had to bike there. So we had our little BMX makeshift uh, bikes from Schwinn, you know, from Schwinn frames, and then BMX uh, hardware. And then I had a paper up and that was the way you delivered papers. And so it was really a utilitarian thing, you know, and, you know, back in those days, mom would have you go pick up something at the grocery store. So you would 
race your time and and try to get better and 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 where we lived at the time there was a lot of desert open desert so those those bikes slowly turned into mountain bikes and um and then uh and then about 2000 or uh sorry 2000 1986 greg lamond won the tour de france and I really didn't know anything about what that was or what racing was, or I didn't even know it was a thing because I was only like 16 years old and I wasn't focused on that. And then um, I started in my 20s just to kind of get back into shape after college, or after college you know, eating and drinking. Um, I took up mountain biking <laughs> and it was really brand new. This is like, it was like the first mountain bikes didn't have gears. They were old beach cruisers with knobby tires. So it was really just a raw kind of fun, exciting sport. And we all wore t-shirts and you know, army, army surplus shorts and uh, Chuck Taylors, because, you know, it was not really <laughs> adapted yet. And then right. over time, I just uh, kept on sticking with it. Um, I have a friend of mine who created a product line called Pack Filler. And it's basically um, all of us in the middle, none of us win, none of us lose, we just kind of fill the void. And so I feel like that's I'm part of the Pack Filler. I'm just one of the guys in the middle. <laughs> usually in the back middle, but yeah, in the middle. And uh, so now I just do it for fun. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, so then that, so roughly we're probably about the same age because in the eighties I was on my bike and that's how I got to work. I live, I was a, a country gal. So farm to the village to work. And until I got my license, of course, right, and then right. that was dropped. And then I got back on the bike in the early twenties when I bought my first road bike. Um, I mean, like, God, I just had like something off the farm when I used to ride, but, uh, yeah. And then, and then twenties got into cycling, but we're going to start with your book because we, we really, I, I really want to feature this book. Um, I had the pleasure of getting a book, Corey sent it to me, and if you can see it's all dog-eared because I literally, um, sorry, but I took it camping with me. <laughs> I like um, to see him beat up, that means that you Oh my gosh, and I have notes in there, and, and I was like, I gotta stop writing all this notes, I just gotta read it, but um, so I actually, Corey, I got this book when I got back from vacation two weeks ago and I'm like oh my gosh and I was supposed to interview Corey about a week ago and I said hey Corey do you think I can postpone it so I can actually read your book so we can have something to talk about and I took it with me to Gas Bay last week and um, <laughs> I, I read it like whenever I could and it's been a long time I don't know if anybody can relate uh, you sit down and actually read a book from start to finish like I've been into so many personal development books. I'm like, oh my gosh, I just need something that's going to be light and fun and relatable. But I have a first question. Okay. Where did you get the title? Yeah. Because I'm like, everybody. I was waiting for it in the back. I'm like, okay, it's going <laughs> to say how, how this all came about, like the Buddha and the bee, because I love it. Yeah, I was struggling with that. I had the story done and I was trying to come up with some sort of name. And, and, um, and I think my brother at the time had, at, we have a pool in our backyard and he was working at a concrete place and he had a giant concrete Buddha. And he's like, Hey, do you want me to put this Buddha in the, in the backyard for you as an ornament? And I'm like, well, let's just hold off. So then I went up to go hike in the mountains and I was hiking in the mountains across the street and there was, it was spring and the bees were out. And I was like, Oh yeah. I was kind of looking at the bees on the cactus blooms and I was like bees and I was thinking in the back of my head of my brother's Buddha and I was just kind of throwing words around. I'm like, well, Buddha and the bee, everybody likes Buddha. Bees are good, you know, everybody <laughs> likes bees. So then I like, oh, how about the Buddha and the bee? So I, I put that in my notes and I came home and I Googled the Buddha and the bee. And it, as you, in this one of the first pages, there's actually a quote. And I was like, oh, this quote nails what the book is about. It's basically you know, traveling through the world, unharming it, but learning from it. And I was like, yeah, that's, you know, as the bee does, right? The bee goes and it, it, it abstract, it takes nectar and then it, it pollinates and yeah. So I can't read it from there, but. But yeah, as a bee gathers nectar does not harm or disturb the color and fragrance of the flower. So does the wise move through the world, Buddha. Yeah. 
So yeah. I was like, that nailed it. So, you know, I guess synchronicity. <laughs> yeah. And I love the wheel because <laughs> I, I, you know, I was just like, oh my gosh, is he really going to do that? Yeah, he is. Well, you know, it's funny about the cover design is I was talking to my editor about it and she said, what do you want on a cover? I said, I want anything, but I don't want a wheel and I don't want a road that goes into infinity. <laughs> and then this is what she came up with. And I said, you know what? That looks really good. <laughs> You're like, did I say not or did yeah. I say do it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I was really happy with the way it turned out. But I like the broken spoke because when you read it, <laughs> we had some serious bike wheel issues at yes. the end. <laughs> yes. and, and I just want to say that, uh, okay, so actually, um, I think we can also, also relate that this, that it happened at the time of 9-11. And when I was reading that, I was just like, it was like a flashback as to where I was sitting when that whole thing happened, when the airplanes crashed into the, uh, the towers, into the World Trade Towers. And it was just funny that that uh, that's where you were at this at that time, and yes. uh, yeah. yeah, just crossing the Rocky Mountains, and mm -hmm. you know, I'd been in my tent for about three days, so I didn't really have access to yeah. a television. So it was just an it's odd. Funny. It's funny, uh, like people, hey, did you hear what happened? What happened? <laughs> yeah, and there's still a people just kind of living their lives because. Uh, I don't, I don't, you know, there's, they're disconnected. Everybody's disconnected at that time. It was interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. And, and also Corey was like, how many Gatorades and egg, uh, <laughs> Subway sandwiches, <laughs> Subway sandwiches, Chinese food. Did you eat? I'm like, does this guy eat at all on his bike? I was like, you guys have to read it. Like, you're just wondering how he even made it grow. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, Gatorade again? Does he does he eat while he rides? Like, how is he doing this? <laughs> well, I have a friend of mine who will do a hundred mile mountain bike race and uh, I'll drink like maybe a half a bottle of water. He's like, you're just like a camel. You know, you don't eat or drink the whole time. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, until you got in trouble. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Anyways, you have to read this and one of the things that I really liked about it is that you had little bits of information about the different places hmm. and I was just like hey kids did you know the Minnesota Vikings was like named after the Vikings who came down like the Mississippi River? <laughs> you know like things like that and and another one I because I, I wrote these down I'm like really and oh anybody stargaze did you know that Orion's belt points east to west? I did not know that. And I look at Orion all the time. Wow. Yeah. You're, you're so an outdoor anyways, person. You should know this. I know. Well, now I know it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and uh, and I'm gonna watch the movie Orphan Train. I took that out of there. And uh, what else did I oh, oh, and you're a scuba diver too. So I was like, oh, oh, and the beckoning cat. The beaconing cat. Oh yeah. I was like, anyways, I thought it was absolutely a, a, a fantastic read. Like I said, I went through this um, in a matter of days. It's an easy read, not to say it's, easy, but it's and it's well laid out. And I like that it's chunked up in days, um, so it's like I could read a little chapter, and it's you know, uh, uh, anyways highly 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 recommended that you guys go try and get uh, get the buddha and the bee we'll put links in the show notes to get to the book but so tell us now that i've talked about the book and everybody's all excited how did you put it together after like 20 years because i was thinking about that too because it's so detailed like yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I like your started feelings and everything because I was like, whoa. Yeah, no. Um, so when I left on the trip, this was 2001, 9-11. So we didn't really have social media. We didn't have any of this, right? Internet was actually kind of first, you know, you'd wait for your little AOL CD-ROM to get the 350 <laughs> like, minutes. Dial in. 
Yeah. And if you were lucky to have like two landlines, so you didn't get yeah, disconnected yeah. when somebody else picked up the phone. So <laughs> I would go to libraries and email um, friends and I had this massive CC list and it just got bigger and bigger as I wrote, uh, wrote along because people were like, hey, can you add me to your list and all this stuff. And, and so my dad had saved all those emails and burned them all into a CD for me. And the, the trip continues after the book, this book ends, um, and that's uh, uh, the second book. But so he had saved those to me and gave them to me. So I had all I had all the details there. And then I went and drove the route again, and you know, just to kind of get a sense of the vernacular because it's been a while, you know, and it's twenty years. But I, I started writing it probably around fifteen years ago. And oh my gosh, really. Yeah, yeah. And I started writing and I put it on my iPad and, and I bought an iPad for the sole purpose of, of this book. That was my justification to buy an iPad because I had no reason <laughs> otherwise to have one. Yeah, right. <laughs> and so, so I had the thing laid out. I was like super excited and I was going over to Europe and I put it in the, in the, in the magazine sleeve and I fell asleep and I woke up and I forgot my iPad on the plane. And so I was like, I was kind of devastated. I was like, well, that dream's over, right? I'll never write this book again. So fast forward about five years later, I sold my company and the company that bought me issued me an iPad. So I got the iPad, I turned it on and that's what I learned about the cloud. All of a sudden my book was there and I was like, oh, this is fantastic. Oh my God, so, are you so, Yeah, kidding? so I started writing again and then I read it and I was like, oh God, five Corey, years more how did you feel so when you saw like, that? this is terrible. This is the worst literature piece ever. So I just, oh, just tore it all <laughs> apart and then rewrote it. And, and I said, well, people don't want to, they don't want to read about some guy philosophizing on a bike who's not a philosopher, you know, and, and what else do you talk about across a cornfield for eight hours, right? So, and I love history and I love little snippets of Americana, mm -hmm. stuff, or not Americana, but little just trivia stuff. So then I started adding those pieces and because I started reading other people's books like Bill Bryson and, and um, you know, William yeah. Lee's Heat Moon and stuff and, and how they bring in just little nippets, but not too much, you know, mm. it's kind of like we, we grew up at the same time. So it was like, remember those commercials? If you want to learn more, go visit your public library. So it was <laughs> like, now we Google, but so yeah, that's how it all kind of came together. And then um, the final draft was, uh, my editor was like, you know, we don't really know who you are in this book. So then I had to insert a little bit more like the letter from my dad and stuff like that. And that was really hard because I don't like to share it. And plus you're sharing too. That was really good, that. actually. Yeah. yeah. Because so you could feel it. like, you know, that if, if that was me, you probably have something that's, you would always kind of look at, like you, whether it's pictures of your family and things like that on the road or something like a letter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the letter was something that kind of came up and because it was one of the only times that he he emailed me the whole time. And then my mom would email me later when I'm in the second book I am and I end up in South America and and I think she emails me after I told her I was mountain biking down the road of death. <laughs> she says, <laughs> I pray for you every day. That was the that was the extent <laughs> of the emails. <laughs> Good moms. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's great. Like so. Okay, I. How did you feel when you got that iPad and you saw that your book was like still there? I you was, must have been like, <gasps> yeah, it was like totally just recharged me. And now I was like, okay, you know, we all set kind of goals for ourselves and we yeah. put these things down, and and we have more. We can make more excuses not to finish them than we do to finish them. I mean, that's. I'm not saying anything that's we haven't heard before, but. Mm -hmm. My, I was kind of like a little bit happy that it did, that it got lost at first because I was like, oh, now I don't have to do this. You know, it's like, oh, this this project, I don't have to put it out there. But then when it came back, I was like, yes, now I get to do this. And, and you know, the vocabulary changes, right? It's like, I, I don't have to do it. I get to do it. And that's what I, yeah. I, I wanted to do it. And I was in the right place in my mind. I was written, you know, everything was lined and I was like, okay. Right. My, and I had just, I've just been recently married. So my wife was super supportive about it. So I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. So yeah. Well, was really it was already half done, right? <laughs> you just <laughs> have to go back. Oh, I would yeah, say it was man. half done, but then I redid it. So it was, yeah. 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 Wow. The shell was there. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I loved the, when you got picked up 
by the Max, was it Mexicans? Well, Wilfred, no, Frederico. Wilf, Ralph, yeah, Wilfredo. Wilfredo, <laughs> like, oh, how is it? But, you know, <laughs> you got out of it. The trailer park. and <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I still do regret missing out on a, a official Guatemalan the, the, trailer The park. meal? <laughs> the meal. Yeah, in the middle it's of Nebraska. Like, but Do I stay there and it begins night and then I can't? But I was just like, oh, my God, what's he going to do? Is he going to walk away? Are they going to take? But I'm like, it's got to end good because there's more to read. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my wife said when she first read it. She was like all tense. And she goes, well, it ends up all right because I married you like 10 yeah, years later. You're still so. here. <laughs> <laughs> but I love it. So, so everybody go find it. Now, obviously, that was, that was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And. It, it, it kind of inspired me to start thinking, I was like, God, could I actually do something? I don't know if I'd do a, a month like that, but you know, just an overnighter for myself, just to, to feel my <laughs> riding with, you know, the packs and everything, but you went on to do more. Like you're talking that you have a couple or another book coming out. What? Okay. So this was like a seriously a serious turning point because you left a job and you kind of broke out on your what happened after this book in 2001 like when you decided you handed in your your um resignation, your resignation and where did you go after that because I was just like okay like life has changed like perspective of life has changed now where did you go after that yeah, so I sat in Carmel for a while, which is not a bad place to hang out. My cousin was <laughs> living there, nice. and she had some friends that needed a house to be sat. So I sat, house sat for Oh, them. yes, that's right. Yeah, so, you know, when you're sitting in the mountains with literally nothing to do and looking at the ocean and drinking wine, you, you know, your mind starts spinning, and you start real. And I had just gotten out of a relationship that was long-term, so I was like, you know, okay, I'm 31, you know, that feels like the end of the road. You know, when you're 31, it's like, oh my God, now I would do anything to be 31 again, but you know, <laughs> now 31 you get serious like, about life. <laughs> yeah. Nice. It's like, oh my gosh, it's over time to go to sanctuary. <laughs> and, um, and so I, you know, I, I just decided to go South and I had always wanted to travel the, the globe and I had done little trips, like, you know, a month here, or a couple weeks there, but nothing like, super epic and so or what I would consider super epic so um I had just sold one of my houses so I had some cash and uh I had another house that I was renting out so I was getting income from that and so um and I was living pretty cheaply <laughs> I mean I had my tent and my you know it wasn't I was my biggest expense was footlong subway sandwiches and Gatorade right <laughs> I mean what does that cost you? And $30 dollars motel rooms <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I got to get this book to the marketing department at Subway, by the way. But anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, so I, I just continued south, and and so I wrote book two, which is called Unlost, and that should be out in a couple of weeks, and and that's about traveling from California, and I end up all the way down in Antarctica. So I spend about eight months kind of backpacking through South America, um, and then from there, book three, which I don't have a name for, and then I I come back, sell my other house. Um, travel through Europe and then go to Southeast Asia. And in Southeast Asia, I end up helping my uncle with his business, which then evolved into me starting a business. So, which I didn't really want to do. I did no desire. I didn't, I was going to go to what Honduras. What kind of business was it? What's that? What kind of business? Well, he had, he had a furniture business. Okay. And so I was just there to kind of like, he didn't like to fly. So I would just go to the factories and make sure that the quality was good. And then okay. the woman who I was working with, who um, was an agent, she had a heart rate monitor business and I had run some marathons and she goes, would you be interested in starting a heart rate monitor business? And I was like, sure, really? you know, like not really, but okay. I'd rather go to Honduras polar? and dive instructor. It wasn't but polar. It wasn't polar. No. <laughs> I was but like, you were my biggest competitor, of course. <laughs> but this was, um, this was 2003. So you know, in 2003, heart rate monitors were, they're not, they weren't new. I mean, Polar came out with them like, like in 90 or maybe 88 or something like this. Well, they're they were the really most expensive. There wasn't really any brand recognition for that. It was, it was kind of a weird product, right? Like nobody, 
knew what it was. So in 2003, there was three things we didn't have in the world that we, that we live off today. One was Amazon. One was iPhones or smartphones. And the other one was just like this knowledge of heart rate monitors. So like now everything is heart rate. And anything you do is all about heart rate and power and stuff. But um, so when I started, everybody had a mom, pa store, right? Like everybody drop ships. It's like Corey's heart rate monitor.com. <laughs> like, Hey, you want to sell my product? And they're like, yeah. So all they did was put your picture up there and you hope you sold three or whatever to them and six to them and whatever. And then, um, I, that ended up, and there, at the time there was like 36 brands out there. I mean, there was cardio sport, Reebok, Nike, you know, I mean, just like everybody had a private label heart rate monitor. So, um, a a guy that I knew told me to get in touch with another guy, you know, type of thing. And I ended up breaking into the school market, K through 12 market. And when I first started, I wanted to be like the biggest heart rate monitor in cycling because, you know, I had this like minor passion in cycling. And then I went to Interbike and I, you know, <laughs> to get to my booth, you had to walk by like Sigma, you know, Garmin. It was like, okay, I don't stand a chance. <laughs> These guys oh, have yeah. small houses built in here with, in their tap and beer. And I was like a little 10 by 10 booth in the back with, you know, with this crooked banner. And, um, <laughs> and so the school market just like all of a sudden opened up and I was like, this is fantastic. This Nobody knows, you know, in the retail market, it's, it was, my brand wasn't probably known at all. Um, but in the, like the other side markets, like schools, um, childhood obesity. Um, I've worked with a lot of Indian nations, um, obesity clinics, stuff like that. That's where it wasn't a, it wasn't a pretty, it wasn't a sexy industry, but it was a money-making industry. So. Wow. So how long did you have that company? So my goal was to sell it in 10 years and I sold it in 10 years and four months, two months. So it was totally dumb luck the time of selling. Um, it was, um, there was a bunch of grants out there by the government. One of my biggest distributors wanted, approached me and, uh, they said, Hey, we're interested in, because I had gone from heart rate monitors to heart rate monitors and pedometers and pedometers were really big back in the day yeah, yeah, yeah. and stopwatches and pulse, pulse oximeters and stuff. So I was okay. working like with medical rehab companies and things like that. And, oh. um, so he, they approached me, oh. they made an offer. I was kind of burnt out. I, after 10 years, just kind of running this thing. And, yeah. and, uh, I was engaged and all these things. So I was like, now's the time they made an offer. Uh, we closed on my birthday. <laughs> so I was like kind of a rebirth type of double, double yeah. thing, you know? And, um, and then I had a two year contract with them. So it, we moved to Texas for two years and oh, okay. uh, lived out the contracts. And then um, my wife and I decided to sell everything uh, in 2015. And nice. we loaded up the little Mazda Zoom Zoom, drove oh, around, nice. did, <laughs> did some camping in the Southwest, went up yeah. to uh, Phoenix, sold the car, got on a plane to Ecuador with everything we owned on our backs and went from there. So then we were down wow. there for about 16 months. Yeah. <gasps> Oh my gosh. So, so talk a little bit about that. So I went yeah, traveling. Just, I couldn't, first of all, I can't imagine I found somebody who was willing to not, not only marry me, but like marry me and then do things like this. Right. Cause she was a partner in a law firm. She was very established. She lived in her, um, Minneapolis for 22 years. So she had her community, she had her life. And then all of a sudden this guy comes along, you know, grabs her up oh. and moves her to Texas and then says, Hey, do you, by the way, do you want to get rid of everything you own materially and travel around South America with me? <laughs> like, this is just what I need. <laughs> <laughs> right. And she was in the right place. I think it sang too. So we, it just really worked well. We first landed, we did an epic trek, which I thought we were going to die on. And then we came back and we volunteered uh, for about a month with um, a group. Uh, it, was a, it was run by the Catholic church by a Jesuit priest. And um, we, we just wanted to volunteer. And that was kind of one of the things we told ourselves is we're going to go down, we're going to track and get healthy. And then we're going to also volunteer and give back. So the first thing we did was we volunteered for a month and it was really great. We, I mean, we fed 600 families every day um, and then we'd go and help them build their houses or whatever. And um, it was a really good organization. And then, um, then we'd go track a little bit and sit on the beach and 
find another volunteer. And we found a website called workaway.info. So it was basically you Google, I want to work at a vineyard in Santiago, and then they'll pop up. And then you can volunteer. Yeah, write that down, workaway.info. And there's just a Everybody. lot of great opportunities. So we volunteered at a hostel for a while. We did a oh. sea turtle rescue in Uruguay. Um, and, oh, uh, that's amazing. Yeah, it was just fun. I mean, and you just kind of, we just made it up. We didn't have any agenda. We had no schedule. Um, we volunteer, we, we house sat, I think it was two months, maybe it was one month, but in Chile in a cabin on the coast, north, two hours north of Santiago with four street dogs. And the closest bodega to get any type of food was um, a mile walk. So it was a mile through the woods and it was just fantastic. And we just sat there every day and we watched the sunset and, you know, the ocean changed. Sometimes it was cold, calm and sometimes it was wavy. We had these four dogs that would go running with us all the time. We had to collect wood to make fire to, to, to keep the house place warm. No internet. It was just fantastic. So yeah, it was fun. Good times. Yeah. Lots of opportunity out there to not do anything. <laughs> if you have money to keep you. Keep well, I tell you what, I'm not going to give you the dollar amount, but the amount of money that we spent when we were down there, it would be, I'll, 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 I'll say this. We were on a beach in Ecuador and I forget the name of it. Monson. I want to say Montanita, but I'm sure I'm, that's not the right one. I did the math and I was sitting in my hammock on the second floor of our hostel, all the free coffee I could drink all day. I, I was 25 meters from the ocean sunsets rises every day at 6 a.m sets at 6 p.m the beach is amazing surfing beach just awesome uh free eggs for breakfast we bought two empanadas for lunch two empanadas at, you know at, for dinner from street guys and then we'd have two of those one and a half liter beer, beers a day and i did the math without negotiating we could live there for fifty eight hundred dollars a year eight hundred dollars a year yes as a volunteer doing nothing but sitting in your hammock, drinking beer, eating empanadas, and trying to write a third book. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's so cheap. Yeah. yeah. That's why one of my girlfriends, she just sold her business, drove out to, out west. I'm sure she sold everything. When, and she sold everything. Her and her husband, <laughs> they drove out. Then they got divorced out there. Oh, no. I was like, oh, my God. But now she's in, like, um Argentina I'm like what are you doing there she's like nothing <laughs> chilling in life because I like I'm I, I knew them for like 15 years and they were like they had a gym and like like all like you know you you could see they're busy busy always doing all different businesses and stuff and I can imagine she just sort of appreciating the uh but um but yeah as she's like it's super cheap here and um, I'm just like, well, what are you doing to keep busy besides going to the gym? <laughs> you know, it's, it's that's why the work away was so great because yeah. there comes a point where you can only sit on the beach for so long, yeah, and not contribute. And then just to call a person up and say, hey, like one guy actually reached out to me and said, hey, do you know how to do tile? Because I have a cabana that needs tiling. And you can stay, you know, and every, every way that they pay you back, they don't pay you back with cash, but usually it's like, you can stay at my place for free and I'll give you breakfast, you know, whatever. They're all different, but some of them are just, they're the opportunity. Well, I mean, nice. that's, that's almost better than cash. Cause you have to, you'll have to find a place and eat anyways, right. you know? Yeah. yeah you know, I'm to, totally the exchange like, rate and all that stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great opportunity. Yeah. 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 So, so let her know. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. I'll send her that, that email. Um, so you guys spent your time there. Now, when did you come back to Arizona to get into the book? And also um, in your book, well, not in your book, but in your bio, you mentioned that you started doing like some charity rides and some fundraising. Do you want to talk because that's all like cycling related and like what yeah. did you end up doing Lucas? So a lot of the things I do like we talked earlier is um kind of off the cuff <laughs> or you know or things just kind of present themselves to you and you're yeah. like oh, okay let's you know 
So I was at, a, I had this woman um, when I had Echo, the company that I, the heart rate monitor company was called Echo, E-K-H-O. And um, she was hounding, I mean, just, it was just unusual. She would just, hey, I need to talk to you. And then she'd reach into me on LinkedIn. I'm like, oh my gosh, like if you found me on LinkedIn and Facebook and you're really, so finally I, I'm like, I don't know, it's Friday afternoon, I decided to call her because it just was a weird her request for weird. And it turns out she was a mother and her, her uh, daughter has congenital heart defect. Okay. And they, and so she's part of this group called Mended Little Hearts. And I had never heard of Mended Little oh. Hearts, but they're an organization that are all over the United States that they might even be international, but um, each state has their own um, division. And then there's a national one. And she said, listen, the, you sell pulse oximeters and those are really important for us because every time we bring our child in, it costs $170 to have them put a pulse oximeter on their finger to see what oh they're doing. Oh my gosh, really? And I'm thinking, well, you could buy one for, <laughs> give you a deal. I'll give you a Mended Little Hearts deal. And so she said, there's a conference in New Orleans, a national Mended Little Hearts conference, and it's for adults and kids. And so I went down there and I met all these parents who, you know, their kids all are dealing with congenital heart defect born with it and you know I mean it's you don't walk away not touched by this by any means so after this trip I selfishly was going to say plan on riding my bicycle from New Orleans to Minneapolis take a two-week vacation because I just needed to get be done and I'm like you know guys when I get back to Minneapolis I'll um I'll uh, call you guys and we'll figure out something and of course being who they were they were like hey better idea. Our offices are in Colorado. So why don't you, instead of biking to Minneapolis, fly home, ride your bike from Minneapolis to Colorado. We'll raise money. And then when you get there, we'll do this whole like firefighter parade and all this stuff and all this stuff. So I'm like, I'll bike. You guys do the money raising. So they're like, okay. So then I kind of called it the tour to mended little hearts. And I think there's some blogs out there that you might be able to find. But so I created this blog and every day a parent would send me their child and you know their information on their child in the bio and then I would write about how and as if me and Timmy were biking together about that day and so it was like I would bring Timmy into the story and then oh, we raised a bunch of money and I was like yeah this is a really great organization and it's one of those ones that you can how can you not get behind right so that was one of them. And then a lot of the other ones were um, just for schools like just different ways for fundraising for schools because schools PE is not physical education is not like the most funded um, curriculum. So um, yeah, it was a lot of those were just like, in a little way they were selfish because I was like trying to figure out how to get the school to raise money so they could buy more of my products. And so I would work with them on things like that. So those were the organizations and that's what, that's kind of got me to continue to cycle and you know, anytime you have an excuse to go ride your bike, it's, if you need an excuse. <laughs> if you need yeah, one. I know. But like, it's so nice to have a purpose too. Yeah. Um, just because then it just makes it more worthy, I guess, or just more important that you're not just on your bike. There's a couple, um, well, there's one guy, Dan Hurd. I don't know if you've um, heard the name before. Okay. he uh he's on his bike again he was biking he biked across the united states for two years he took two years and he was biking for awareness uh suicide awareness okay. as an ex-military guy who almost took his life a couple of times um oh, yeah. yeah dan heard or daniel heard a h-u-r-d um and I'll send you, I'll send you the podcast link, but, uh, he was another guy who's totally inspired to, and it just got on his bike like yourself and just started riding and then, and just sharing his story, um, which was, he was one of the first people that I interviewed actually. Okay. And, um, and I'm going to be interviewing him again because he actually got hit by a car. <laughs> Oh. And he was like last November or so, and he was out injured, thankfully not too badly, um, but he's getting back, he got back on his bike and he's continued riding. But, um, and I'm not sure if he's around you, but I'll connect you guys. But I love the fact that, you know, people get on their bikes for certain reasons. 
and um, tell us about uh, your new book that's coming out. Yeah, so so Unlost again is um, it's kind of like the bike trip from Minneapolis to California kind of let me shed like it let me like there's a it's it's kind of hard to break out of society I I don't I think people can relate with this I think there's I think there's a you know we're all the reason why we sit behind a desk for eight hours a day is because for some reason somebody told us that's what we're supposed to do right and we don't live life on our own terms I mean how many times do we all hear you know one day I'm going to do this right that's that whole it's just cliche and so this bike trip was like it all of a sudden made me realize by the toward the end that I was like I can do whatever I want to do right like I don't have to sit behind the desk and you know and, and grind and, and do all that but I will say once you get behind the desk again it's 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 you, you quickly remember you kind of go back you devolve into that again and so when I got to California I was like I'm not done yet like I'm not done this is the opportunity uh, you know, I'm 31. I've been wanting to travel around the world all my life. So, uh, you know what? If uh, my but my biggest concern was, will I ever be able to get a job when I go back? You know, it's like, will I ever be able to work again? I mean, I'm taking a year or two year. I don't even know how long I'm going to be gone. I've, I've been gone for two months. Am I going to be gone for a year? Am I going to ever come back? You know, whatever. So that was my that was always in the back of my head because I had never not worked since the age I could work. <laughs> so. Um, so yeah, so then traveling through South America, then I started meeting all these backpackers from all over the world, and you start realizing that you know there's people. I, I mean, I met I met this woman, Gabby. She had been roaming around for seven years, you know, and she was like thirty. And I'm just like, how do you what? How do you I, I, tell? Like, aren't you worried about retirement? And aren't you worried about this? And what about you know? And uh, you know, she's. She was just like, she was an Ecuadorian, Australian, um, and, uh, and she didn't have a care in the world. And it, I was just like, wow, I really admire that. And like, I, like I told you about work away, it was just like, oh, you need to stop and make some money and eat food. There's opportunities. They're all over the world. It's just fantastic. So then that opened my eyes to that. And then I was just like, I'm just going to keep traveling. So, you know, I went to Mexico and then Mexico, I ended up in Guatemala and then Guatemala, I was in South America. And then South America, I just kept on going. And then in Ecuador, I started getting bored. I was like, okay, how many pictures of a door can you take, right? Like how many cathedrals <laughs> can you go into before you've seen enough cathedrals? And yeah, really. Um, I was like looking for something to do, get something to give me a, um, a goal. And so I mm-hmm. happened to see that there was a marathon in Antarctica. And I was like, huh. So I Googled the Duray's director and I'm like, hey, listen, I, I'm, I don't want to do the whole tour. I just want to meet you guys in Ushuaia. How, what, can you discount me the ticket? And he's like, yep, I'll give you a discount. Just meet us in Ushuaia. So I'm like, all right. So like I had three or four months to get down there and I just trekked and trained and ran and did whatever. Got down there and hopped on the boat, went down to Antarctica and ran the marathon. And then I was like, okay, I'm not done yet. So I came home uh-huh. and started my second house and went to Europe. And so, yeah, then just the story continued, sort of going back to what we talked about before, ended up in Europe and then Asia and then started a business. So. Right, right. Wow. So I know, I know a lot of people who do travel for events, mm-hmm. but it's usually in conjunction with some sort of holiday. I'm sure. like, how can you call that a holiday? Like you've got to, you're going there for an event, you're going to be wiped, you have to like... <laughs> but I get it. it. It's an opportunity. And I know a lot of people who do it, but um, so you've got a new book coming out, Corey. When should we expect that? I was hoping it would have been out on ARC today, but um, we're just wrapping today? up some, today, but it's, that's not going to be the case. It's, we're just wrapping up some of the interior layout right. uh, stuff. So um, I'm kind of hoping it'll be on Amazon in two weeks but i'm gonna say three weeks because i know how things go (laughs) and next week i'm going to be in california with my wife for vacation so i don't know how much work will get done so yeah thank you for uh rescheduling for me so is it going to be laid out this similar to this like per day is that how you're doing it that's you know it's funny it's um 
I don't, there's no chapters in the book actually. It's, it's, and I was talking to my editor about that. I said, I don't know if I want chapters. She said, you know, it, it's your book. You can do whatever you want. You could have it one giant paragraph if you want, you know? And I'm like, huh, well, so it's broken down by like, um, look like places that I go from, like from the border of Mexico to Mexico city. So that might be a story, you know, and then there's Mexico uh, city. Oh, so okay. I guess in theory, there is a chapter, there's a place to, you know, bend the leaf on the paper and uh, <laughs> continue on later, but it's, um, it's, so it's not really laid out day by day. Cause there, it was eight months, nine months. And, you know, there wasn't, there was a lot of days where there's nothing to talk about. <laughs> So. Oh, yeah, obviously, like, I know when you're cycling, you're like, it's, you know, like, every day you had a goal to get to the next city and what, what happened basically in that day, which yeah. makes more sense, a little bit easier to talk about. But I know when you travel, it's like, you got three days of traveling. Oof, what am I gonna say? I sat on a truck, I saw a chicken, I, got, right. you know, like, I drank some chai. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So it's more of like condensed versions of, you know, a week in Mexico City, you know, turns into. Oh, I think that's going to be very entertaining then. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, it's a little bit, um, I just, it's, I think, I hope it, I hope when you read it, uh, you see the same personality. Like in this book, I, 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 my goal was to, when you start reading the book, you see kind of my, na my how naive I was about biking and, you know, just kind of like how I was really tense and, and structured. And then I slowly evolved into this person. It was like, dude, like anything, I don't care. Like anything could happen today. If I want to just like sit in the desert and stare at the sun, I will do that. Like my life just like totally changed. So it was like, oh, flat tire, old lady on the highway. I'll help. I'd love to help you out. Let's let's talk for 10 minutes, you know, 20 minutes, whatever. What was that? Pick me up, you know, like, or I'll take you, I'll take a ride. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think this, I hope, continues that like kind of laid back personality. And then mm -hmm. just um yeah, I, I hope so. I hope I'll, I'll send you a copy when it's when it's done. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> let me let me evaluate the book. Nice. All right. But uh but yeah, I like this because you had a sense of cockiness, I have to say. Oh, okay. I think. Okay. Like at, at when you're sort of like, oh, I'm so you know, I did the first I'm looking for somebody to give me some affirmation that I did amazing. <laughs> like there's nobody around. <laughs> I guess I, I, I guess I didn't think of that as cocky. I was kind of thinking of that as more like, um, yeah, maybe like, yeah, getting to the top like, of the Rocky Mountains. Just like, hey, where's my T-shirt? Like, yeah, right? like. <laughs> yeah. But that's what made me laugh. It wasn't like a bad cockiness. It was just, okay. <laughs> just okay. kind of amusing because you're like, hey, like I just uh, cycled seventy k. <laughs> yeah, like I should be ready for the Olympics. Where's now. my uh, parade? Well, the, I don't know if I mentioned it in the book, but I know when I got to Tahoe, I ended up staying, hanging out with some people and they, they were like, Hey, let's go, let's go do a quick lap around Lake Tahoe, which is like 80 miles or something. And I'm like, of course. I mean, I just biked across the alkaline desert. Oh and yes, you did. Around. And they kicked your ass. And they totally, and then it got to the point where like, we'd go into a parking lot. I'm a worse, I'm a terrible climber. And we go to a parking lot and they're like, Oh, let's all slow down. There's a speed bump coming up, you know? And I'm like, dude, like, give me a little slack here but yeah they were and they were hung over that was even the worst part is they beat me while they were hung over i was like yeah i'm, I'm not on that level <laughs> well i i think i think riding consistently with a pack on and i was looking at your pack i'm like oh my god that was only one day that was only one day though that was just the first day oh you changed it up yeah, yeah, the, yeah. I, I took, I got rid of everything because that, that's when I realized I didn't need three books and and you know all this camping gear and all this stuff. All I needed was my tent and sleeping bag, and so I got rid of everything but my tent, sleeping bag, and my chaco sandals and like a clean T-shirt and shorts. <laughs> that was it. Like it was like I don't need. There's nothing I can't get on the road from here on in. Well, that's you know. just it. I'm like, like because. I was like, well, what is he eating while he's, and I remember I just mentioned that at the beginning of the interview, but I was like, was he eating? Because like when I ride, I had, I'm like constantly eating, but you're like chocolate bars and Gatorade and like maybe, 
Two Snickers. <laughs> egg, yeah, I can egg go rolls. 136 miles and... on two Snickers. <laughs> I'm like, well, if I could go from village to village and not camp and just stay in a hotel, <laughs> your hotels are funny. Anyways, I absolutely really snickered a couple times <laughs> and, and this and um I was like hey kids um but uh, so totally looking forward to your new book and what exactly are you doing right now um well I was so when we came back to the states from South America the plan wasn't to be here in Phoenix the oh. plan was actually to go to Southeast Asia for three years <laughs> So what happened is we came back and I ended up finding a consulting job for a startup heart rate monitor company. And, oh, no way. Look and so that. I just kind of kind of working with the, and, and my, lawyer, my wife is a lawyer and, and she got our law license back because we were going to buy like a sprinter van and just like travel around the U.S. and live in a sprinter van. And then she got this wonderful offer from one of her, the last company she worked at. And we we're just like, you know, how quickly you get sucked back in. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. all of a sudden we were like, I want to that when COVID to hit too. I'm sorry. Is that when COVID hit too? No, this was 2017. We came back. So 2015, okay. we left 2017. We came back. And so, no, it was, um, and we were kind of living in Airbnb. We, we bought a truck and we were just kind of Airbnb ing it. And I was like, I want to move back to Phoenix. We met in Minneapolis when we first met. Uh -huh. And both of our moms moved, live here. So we were like, yeah, yeah, let's just move back. And so we found a house that we love and, and now we're, you know, working stiffs and we work oh, at no. home and I just stopped, I just ended my contract with this contractor. So now I'm kind of focused more on writing more and now with the, who knows where we're at with COVID, but you know, if I can get out there and do some more, you know, marketing, you know, face to face, that's, that's kind of my goal, but um, I am how plan, planning a bike trip from Phoenix to Florida, and now I just got to get oh. approval, you know, from, from my wife that I can take 26 days off to do it, but that will be a credit card ride. I call them credit card rides where you have a day pack and you go hotel to hotel and it's like credit card ride. Yeah. It's <laughs> my wife and I rode from Dallas to Minneapolis and took us 16 days and we went from Marriott to Marriott. It was just like the best. Marriott to Marriott. Five-star hotel to five-star <laughs> You You got your cold beer waiting for you when you get there. Oh, yeah. And all the beer you drink. <laughs> Forget the Gatorade. Where's my six-pack and my, and my egg rolls? <laughs> yeah, beer and whiskey. It's a savior. Oh, gosh. Well... Yeah. I would, I would say that this is not a book to try to follow if you were planning a bike trip across country, right? I mean, when you leave Minneapolis to go to California with, what, four tubes in case you make it a flat tire, that's not a good well, that's example. Another thing, yeah, why do I need more tubes? I'm <laughs> yeah, I'm never going to, why would I get a, get a flat tire? I think yeah. I got like 13 of them in Colorado. Oh, is that the, the Spurs? Yeah, the town of Julesburg. Yeah, the Sandburs. Sandburs, that's yeah. it. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> what the fuck? Anyways, but I wish you luck on that. Thank you. Um, we will have to have you back for the next book. Okay. Even though it's not cycling related, we'll we'll just tag on to this one. And you can also talk about your Florida trip and how that goes after when was the last time you like did our little road trip a bike trip I should say really the last one was 2017 when we flew back to the states my wife and I we had our friend ship our road bikes to Dallas and that's when we rode our bikes from Dallas to Minneapolis and that was the rides as well uh, well she, she that's not her like go-to yeah. Um, and I don't like to ride with her cause she's faster than me. So it's one of those, <laughs> she didn't ride bikes before I kind of introduced her to it. And then right away she was faster than me. And I was like, yeah, that's, you know, whatever. Oh, no, that is funny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Lucky like for me. She did... I'm sorry. <laughs> I like to meet her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's, she's a little, she's, she's type A, but she won't, she won't admit it. <laughs> well, if she's a lawyer, usually it's. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, okay. So we're going to have you back, Corey. Now, before we go, 
where can everybody find you? And where can you find the book? Because I will add an Amazon link. Where else can you find it? Okay, first of all, where can they find you? Which is probably where you're going to find the book. Like me, like right now in my office, GPS. No, like or? social media. Yeah, I, I mean, Corey Mortensen um, I author your... is on Facebook. Okay. Um, if you go to my, uh, if you type in um, either whitecondor.com, which is my publishing company, Okay. or the Buddha and the bee.com with no spaces or periods. Right. Um, it'll take you to the website and then our social media leaks are on there. And there okay. you can also, it, if you click on buy now, it'll take you to the Amazon store. So <laughs> um, yeah, or Barnes and Noble or any, any of those kind right. of places. Yeah, it's perfect. You, but if you go to Amazon, make sure you type in the whole title because there's like a lot of the Buddha and the Right. Um, and there's one that always pops up. It's called The Buddha and the Badass. And I, I, I think I have to buy this book just because I'm really curious about it now because it keeps popping up <laughs> whenever I type in The Buddha. Oh, you're, you're quite the badass, Corey. You know, I think, well, be. he beat me to the cool name, you know? So, <laughs> or she. I like B better, actually. <laughs> nice. It would never fit on the book. That's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah. We would have covered up too much of the wheel. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's very symbolic, actually, I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's been an absolute pleasure. I want to thank you. I want to thank our uh, listeners. And like I said, everything will be in the show notes. So you guys can go and get your own um, copy. And we're going to eagerly wait the new copy of your new book coming out. Um, and is it, did you say there was another one after that? Yes, but I don't know the name of it. Oh, yeah, I'm working on that right now. So it's you want some help? Uh, yes, yes, because this it, what's it about? Well, so the second one is from California to Antarctica, and then and then the third one is going to be coming back to the states, selling my other house that I had, because now I'm officially checking out. Right, I'm done oh. with society. <laughs> so it's flying. I start in Iceland, and then go to Scotland and the UK. Um, timing ends up perfect where I end up running with the bulls in Spain and then following oh, yeah. the Tour de France in 92. So that was like Armstrong's second year, I think it was. And then end up in South, North in East Europe and then end up in Southeast Asia. So what kind of do. title are you looking for? I what do what you... I like, like Unlost kind of came around. It was actually going to be something completely different, but um ended up with unlost and right now i've kind of I've, the working title is called embracing bewilderment it's a roomy quote about getting rid of be, uh -huh. stepping out of the comfortable and embracing the uncomfortable and so that's kind of where it's at but i don't think that's gonna fly <laughs> uh, yeah you need to be catchy like this one the tongue. maybe something about the bulls well, the thing is, is like, it's the bulls are just one small part, right? Because it's like all of Southeast Asia. I think I spend more time in Southeast Asia in the book than I do in Europe. So we'll see. But this one doesn't have anything to do with Buddha. Or bees. Or bees. And that's one of my favorite reviews. So somebody left me a one-star review and said, this book has nothing to do with Buddha or bees. And I was <laughs> like, yes, that's true. That's the whole point. <laughs> You're just waiting to hear about what's all about. <laughs> right, like how far in the book did you go before you read? <laughs> well, I was just like, okay, there's nothing about, and I'm like, I have to ask. Yeah. So then maybe you just make a title that's really catchy. Yes, that's what I'm trying to do. Think. That's, but but yes. if you put bulls in it, like bull. Well, I was like Anyways. thinking bulls and temples because like I visit a lot of temples in Southeast Asia. So I don't know because it's. It's hard. It's it's a big world to put a small title onto, you know. And you don't want to be like old guy on a bike, right? <laughs> There's actually a book title called "Old Guy on a Bike," and I was like, no. <laughs> like I could relate with that title, and I know. Yeah, I that's right. Know You're not that old yet, though. <laughs> yeah. But All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks. So everybody, if you can think of something for a, a great catchy title. Yes. Um, send it off to Corey. Uh, you can find him. <laughs> just Google him on social media or 
jump into one of the links above and send them like, hey, this is what I think you should, or here's my ideas. I still think bull should be in there. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you so much, Corey. Have an amazing awesome. day, everyone. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for your time.